This week on Security Weekly, we get jiggy with Mr. Steven Sims from the Sands Institute on Exploit Development. We talk about how Microsoft is going to add support for SSH. Holy SSH shit. All that and more on Security Weekly. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sniffed. And the cocktails. Close City. Paul Security Weekly. Brought to you by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. And Bionapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. It's time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself an adult beverage, and give the intern control of your Bitcoin miner because here's your host, a man who changes your paradigm with glitter, Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to Security Weekly, episode 421 for June 4th, 2015. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian, excited as ever. Is that what that smell is? About that show. <laughs> Because in studio, to my right, there are two lovely gentlemen. The first one immediately to my right is Mr. Not Kevin here in studio. Imagine that. Whoa. 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 You did like the Keanu Reeves, like, whoa. Whoa. (laughs) I know Kung Fu. (laughs) I did just watch Point Break, so. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, that's good in the dream right now. It's one of my favorites. Mr. Larry Pesci is here in studio as well. My chair feels really low. I feel short. Well, mine feels kind of high. Maybe we need to trade. Your your chair is just left over from last week on show four. Your chair is low. I noticed that in your shot. Like, it was just like you above your laptop like this. (laughs) Oh, Oh, hey, now we're in full color, not sepia. This edition of Security Weekly brought to you in full color Yes, by Mr. (laughs) Michael Santarcolangelo. There we go. Uh, I was worried you were going to say it right. Yeah, I know. I, I, I had to I had to throw that in there. The, the, the shot of us is only allowed to be in CPF Jack's here. That's right. That's right. Mike, welcome to the show. Always good to be here, guys. Yes. It's nice to have you. I wish I could hear you over the music, but the music is like really loud in my headset right now. Did you notice that? It's what? Great. I feel like I'm talking at a club. Well, what? I don't, I don't what? Have to listen to you, so it's what? I'm getting old. I can't hear anymore. What's going on? How are you, Santa? I'm good, man. Life is good in the beach. I actually did a trip to Minneapolis this week. This is the time of year when you can go to Minneapolis if you live on a beach. <laughs> so yes. it, was, it was excellent. Yes, this is true. Yes. Um, a couple quick announcements before we get started. Ready to learn combat firmware analysis? Register for my Black Hat course, Embedded Device Security Assessments for the rest of us. A two-day hosted class at Black Hat Las Vegas. I think it's like in the next day or two, you got to register to get the cheapest price. So registration includes breakfast, lunch, access to Black Hat briefings, business hall, sponsor workshops, sponsor sessions, and arsenal talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register Today, Larry, do you want to talk about your SANS classes uh, next? Whichever, yeah. Yeah, let's, well, let's do it now because okay. we're going to interview uh, someone from SANS, and I think it all kind of blends together. Nick, I don't know if you have that <laughs> image cued. No, not that one. That was for, <laughs> that was for Baltimore. <laughs> which is coming up in a, just over a week. That's our Baltimore image, uh, which is of riots for those listening to the audio yes. version. Uh, but you're teaching yes. in Baltimore. I'm teaching in Baltimore, next not next week, week, the week after. The week after. And okay. then immediately following that in uh, Berlin, Germany, which has been very interesting because I'm giving a Sands at Night talk as well, yes. which is one of the talks that I've given before, but it hasn't been, in, it hasn't been to Germany. Yeah, it's um, different speaking in Europe. Yeah, yeah, and the content. I actually need to update the content because the RF laws are a little bit different in, in Germany. Yeah. And a lot of it recenters around ham radio stuff. And, Interesting. Um, I have actually all my paperwork sitting on this laptop so that I can actually use my ham radio in Germany. While I'm there, <coughs> I so. got gotcha. you. Um, nice. Yeah, it was it was interesting because like the the laws were circular. It says yeah. if you want to do this, points to this, and this points to that, and that points to this, and this points to go look here, which points to. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like those errors I used to get in OS2 Warp. They used to say, refer to this error number, and that error number would refer to this error number, and that error number would say, please refer to your systems administrator. And I'm like, I am the systems administrator, <laughs> damn it. Nice. 
On the line, nice. <laughs> via Skype, we've got a very special guest for this evening. Steve Sims is an industry expert with over 15 years' experience in information technology. Stephen Cullen works out of the San Francisco office, or his home office, or office, as a consultant performing reverse engineering, exploit development, threat modeling, and penetration testing. Uh, Stephen is, of course, uh, an author and senior instructor for the Sands Institute, where he teaches 700-level course SEC 760 Advanced Exploit Development for Penetration Testers. Although you said you changed the name. is that That's not the one you changed the name of. That was 660, right? right. You changed the name <clears> of. <throat> so um, welcome, Steve, to the show. Thanks. How's it going? Good. Welcome back, I should say. You've been on the show before. It's nice to have you back, of course. Um, so, Steve, uh, uh, the last time we talked, uh, since the last time we've talked, a lot has happened in terms of exploit mitigations, specifically on the Windows platform. Can you tell us about some of the techniques you use to get around those new um, uh, exploit mitigations? It's straight to the advanced stuff, huh? <laughs> Boom, we're diving straight in, Steve. You know. um, yeah, I mean... Microsoft for a while there, I think everyone's in agreement that uh, many will say that the de facto exploit technique and standard was to go after browsers and Adobe and things like that for use after free bugs. I mean, people were making a lot of money selling those things to places like iDefense and ZDI and other locations. Um, <clears throat> but Microsoft, you know, last was the last June, July, they added a couple new controls uh, specifically aimed at use after free, which was the isolated heaps and also the deferred free. And um, also Control Flow Guard was something that came out the end of last year, which really yep. started kicking off early this year and mid this year. But So you know, what, what, is, what does Control Flow Guard do? It uh, basically makes a, a, creates a bitmap of the application of all the indirect calls that are legitimate, like all the safe calls within the, the, the DLL or the executable that's being compiled uh, creates this nice big bitmap of it so that if you get something like an indirect call, say a call to a pointer that's held in the EDX register or something like that, it checks to see if it's a if it's a valid safe one. And if it's not, then it throws an exception. It doesn't let you do it. So it's a pretty good one. It's a, yeah. it's a compile time control, though. So you've got to compile uh, everything. Okay. And it's only, only supported on Windows 10 and, and Windows uh, 8 Update 3 right now. So not a lot of people, not a lot of people's applications have that in it yet. No, no, like Flash is compiled with it now, but, you know, there's a, somebody found, I think it was Core Security or some other folks found a bypass technique using the just-in-time compilation of um, action script and Flash objects. So Flash again to the rescue. <laughs> oh, I, so they compiled it in compile time, but they found some functions that uh, basically compile at runtime mm -hmm. that didn't take advantage of Control Flow Guard. Yeah, like action script bytecode and stuff as it gets compiled after runtime. Yeah, it's, it's, it can't participate in Control Flow Guard. Interesting. Seems like there's always a way around these exploit mitigations. Yeah, and which is why you know you you look at a Venn diagram and you want to merge all the different circles with the different categories of exploit mitigations to kind of it's you know defense in depth. You don't want to re rely on just one of these things. So I see, I see. Um, so what are some of the other exploit uh, mitigate mitigations that you're talking about? Well, the um, deferred free and the isolated heap that was something that should have been there a long time ago the isolated heap basically tries and says um people try to attack certain types of html objects you know they're, they're created from the same classes the same functions within the same classes from mshtml.dll and and everything kind of gets created in the process heap the default process heap and so if an attacker can identify a use after free condition they can easily replace the object by generating or creating one of these objects because they know it's going to be placed in the exact location where something just got free. Oh, I see. Mm. So, so Isolated Heap says, let's identify some sensitive ones and or critical ones and let's put them in a separate heap so it's more difficult for an attacker to, to, to replace it. Now, a lot of these mitigations, Steve, it seems like it, in, it involves the developer. Like they have to write there and tune their application. Like what's the time to adopt some of these new methods when they come out? Does it vary or is it, is it pretty, mm. pretty static? Well, the compile time controls are more of a pain because you know you have to go and recompile everything. And usually, if there's one weak library or module in the in, in the application that's being loaded, it breaks the whole thing. But controls like um, the the isolated heap that's compiled into MSHTML.dll. So if Internet Explorer is running, it's using that protection. I got gotcha. you. So that's nicer. Yeah, yeah that's nicer. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about Emmet for a little while. Um, We've interviewed the uh, one of the project leads for the Emmet project, Jonathan Ness, on the show before. Yep. 
uh, it seems like a really great product that people can use to prevent a lot of the exploitation from happening on Windows in, in many different applications. Um, what are some of the bypasses? Um, well, first off, I mean, yeah, it, 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 sadly, it's got a really low adoption rate, like under 10%. I heard 5% before, which seems low, but I, I believe it, uh, you know, because it got a real bad rep reputation when it first came out. It was kind of broke a lot of things mm -hmm. and um, was a little bit more difficult to administer, didn't have as much granularity or configuration support with like domain support, GPOs and stuff. But now it's like 5.3 is just, or 5.2, I mean, way, way, way further along. It's, it's so easy to configure. You can choose one application and choose one exploit mitigation to run on that one application, and that's it if you want. So the bypass techniques really, some demonstrations have been done, like uh, Jared DeMott and stuff, it did some cool demonstrations of bypassing at RSA uh, or B-Sides last year in San Francisco. Uh, and that was back on like 4.1, I think. And then Offensive Security did some cool work showing how you can bypass like 5.0 and 5.1. And then 5.2 came out, I think, March, a couple months ago. And that one really focused on um, God mode, you know, the, the JavaScript um, God mode taking away that support. And the bypass te techniques mainly have been identifying like a, a bit that needs to be flipped in memory. And if you flip that bit in memory, then it turns off the majority of the controls mm -hmm. or – or looking at each individual control. Like, so what Jared DeMott was doing, um, I don't want to speak for him, but basically looking at the different ROP-oriented controls, like the ones that say stack pivot protection. If you steal the, the stack pointer away from the stack onto the heap, you need to kind of write a little loop that writes your code, your ROP chain, onto the stack and then pivot the stack pointer back to the stack to get around that one. And kind of, it's kind of fun because you take a, an exploit with, without e emit running, and then you, and it works. And then you turn on one of those Emmet controls at a time, and then you figure out how to bypass. It's like a video game. So uh, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, that's 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 pretty neat. Um, yeah, why do you think it, it? Do more people just need to be educated about the newer versions of Emmet? Is it just like a marketing campaign that Microsoft needs to go on in order to get widespread adoption of Emmet, or do you think people's priorities are not just kind of in line for implementing that kind of software? Yeah, I think the, it's a bit of it's a bunch a bunch of things. I think part of it is a lack of understanding from your your domain administrators as, as to how much value there are, and a big fear of is it going to break something? I don't want to do the scream test. I mean, maybe some folks think think that if you turn it on, it's for everything, but in reality, if you were to turn if your organization's using Internet Explorer, and you're using Adobe products and Flash and Microsoft Office Suite, if you turn on Emmet just for those applications alone, you're getting rid of like 90% of the zero days that would affect your organization. So at least turn it on for those. And like anything else, when a new version of Emmet comes out, you wouldn't just blindly put it out there. You're going to test it for a couple months. And if you have, I mean, if you look at that exploit last year, I think FireEye discovered it being used in a wild. It was the one that affected the, um, the uh, Veterans of, Department of Veterans Affair, I think, but it actually did a check to see if Emmet was running on the system before it decided to exploit you with the use after free. So kind of neat. Yeah. Do you, do you see attackers starting to worry about Emmet? No. No. Not really. Not really. I mean, it's because the adoption more, is so low. Yeah. It's more of a targeted thing. And, and even if some organizations are using it, pushing it out to every system is unlikely and um, less likely, I guess you could say. But mm -mm. That's interesting. That's a good defensive te technique for, uh, for folks. Um, <clears throat> So uh, is there anything uh, kind of new? Oh, PowerShell. You mentioned PowerShell earlier, um, that you added some of that to the class. Now, do you, are you using PowerShell to be able to um, write exploits, or are you writing exploits for PowerShell? Like, what's the, what's the PowerShell integration? Um, mostly using, like, Jim Shoemaker had uh, added the modules on PowerShell to 660, the one Sans course I, a lead author on. And it really looks at... Um, kind of replacing a lot of the things that we're used to doing with the old cmd.exe and WMI and, and doing it with PowerShell instead, How, like, um, primarily post-exploitation, so not really exploiting the system with PowerShell, but a lot of post-exploitation activity. Mm -hmm. We get into that um, just because it, it's, it's, hence the name, it's extremely powerful. And when it first came out, I was kind of like, eh, it's just another thing. And then you look at it, once the more you get to know about it, it's amazing. So it's, it's, a, it's a great tool. And there's a lot of bypass techniques too. So, Steve, you said uh, before that uh, your two classes, 660 and 760, are primarily focused on the exploitation. 
But if you take 660, there's some advanced penetration testing techniques in there. What are some of the advanced pen testing techniques that aren't exactly like teaching people how to write exploits? Like there's some other content in there, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Josh Wright did a lot of really great um, authorship in the course with kind of hacking routing protocols. So going after 802.1x and NAC deployments and network access control, um, doing things like VLAN hopping, a few different ways to do VLAN hopping, IPv6 attacks. So get into a lot of the network attacks and I mean, a lot of pen testers, maybe because it's not in scope, but maybe it should be in scope. I mean, I find when I'm doing scoping and rules of engagement and all that unfun stuff, it's usually a lack of understanding. I mean, some organizations, as we know, don't really want to pen test. They just want you to check the box that everything's okay to get through an audit. But then the ones that do want a real pen test may not know that the their routing domain and stuff like that, layer two, should be in, in scope. And you got to be real careful with it. I mean, we always say in class, you don't want to just go start hacking away at OSPF and BGP and interrupting the routing domain. Right. But, um, but audit, auditing auditing the router configuration and, and replicating it in a the lab, there's no reason why you shouldn't do that. And we get a lot into pen testing, uh, cryptographic implementations, so hash length extension attacks and uh, CBC bit flipping and all those fun things. And then a lot of network booting, so pre-execution environment stuff, because more and more organizations are kind of focusing on the DLP thing and saying, well, we don't want people taking this stuff home, so we're going to keep it kind of the, all the hard disks in a storage area network. And when you boot up your system, you get a network boot, and that's becoming more popular, especially in defense environments and stuff. So, hmm. <clears throat> Do you find, Steve, that people are taking your class that they're penetration testers? You know, they're like Larry, for example. They're out on the road, you know, 50, 60 hundred percent of the time or whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. right? They're off doing penetration tests. And do you find them taking the class and say, well, I want to integrate some exploit development in it? And does your average penetration tester, in your opinion, have that time? Are there methods they can use to learn how to do some quick exploit stuff while they're on a pen test? Or is this all really stuff that you learn to do a, a pen test of a specific system, uh, not in a more general setting? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and a very big question. I mean, a, a lot of the people that I talk to, I've been teaching for SANS for nine years, and I travel around the world a lot. I mean, I was just in Bangkok and Singapore and Amsterdam and Munich, and I'm only saying that because I get that international input too, which is really nice to get. And <clears throat> consistently, it seems most people get to do the exact same thing every single time they do a pen test. They look at mm -hmm. you know RD, RDP man in the middle. They look at LSA secrets. They look at uh, pass the token, pass the ticket, or pass the hash, all that stuff. Um, and a, a lot are doing more insider, more of the insider penetration testing. And, and of course, you got your web app stuff too. And mm -hmm. a, a lot of the, um, so it's a 660 course. A lot of the pen testers come in and say, you know, I already know all that stuff. I want to do, I, I want to get better at, at more advanced things that normally take a lot of time to do and, and I think I was mentioning to you before where the better you get at fuzzing and using tools like AFL the American fuzzing lop um, from El Camtouf and, and those guys and uh, the, the, the faster you are at it the more realistic it is to have it as something you would do in a pen test mm -hmm. so yeah your average pen test does not include exploit development and uh, zero day but product security testing is getting way more popular a lot of organizations need help with the secure development lifecycle and working with the developers and um, so a lot of the black box stuff is getting more popular. There's a lot more people focusing in on um, instrumentation-based fuzzing and things like that. So it's, it's fun. So I would say the average person coming in wants to learn the exploit dev stuff and just wants to learn the more advanced, the harder stuff. That's more difficult to do on your own. So now you get a lot of developers that take your class that want to learn how to write exploits so they can write more secure code. Or is it more programmer that wants to take your class because they want to become a security researcher? Yeah, that's another good question. I mean, I live in the Bay Area, so there's a lot of organizations around here. I mean, you've got Google with Project Zero and you, VMware, FireEye, Microsoft, um, Apple, uh, countless organizations hiring for security researchers and exploit vulnerability researchers and stuff way more than five, ten years ago. I mean, that was kind of almost unheard of. It was way more boutique. And now it's a lot more companies trying to bring that expertise in-house to work with their developers during the development life cycle. And, and so we're getting a lot of developers come in, to, uh, especially in 760, who work in the C, C++ programming space, um, primarily to fo focus on doing better SDL, so secure development life cycle uh, with their SDLC. And doing, knowing when it's a good time to do proof of concept 
um, because sometimes you know you, you you find something in Fortify through static analysis, or you do some dynamic analysis maybe, and you find a bug. And and in my experience, you oftentimes the developers just don't like you by default because you're this guy there that's looking at their code. They already don't like you. Um, they, they, they don't trust you. They probably don't respect you. And you've got to prove that. And it, it takes a lot of work and demonstrating them some POC and helping with the education side, you know, really is, is a cool thing. Mm. Uh, now, Steve, you say you've done uh, some uh, kind of research and, and help companies with um, their uh, SDLC, and what, what's the most common mistake that you find when you go in and you evaluate how organizations are developing software? You know, from a security perspective, what well, oftentimes what's missing in that process? Yeah, I mean, that's it depends on the client, really. There's so many different types of clients, and as you can imagine, some organizations like Google are very mature with their security, and they've got some just brilliant folks working there. Yeah, but other organizations that, that don't have as much talent there when it comes to that level of security. Um, I, I would say that uh, getting security built in earlier into the development life cycle is, is probably the most critical. So you've got traditionally, you've got your requirements phase and your design and implementation phase and verification and release. Um, getting that in there during the design and the requirements and, and implementation is, is where it's most critical. There's also like the SDL adds on the training onto the front of that saying a developer should get at least a week of security training on the language that they program in per year. And, and an interesting thing I've seen is now coming out of college, you've got people who are way, way more smarter when it comes to security. And they've been writing exploits and buffer overflows and things like that for their entire comp sci program. And then you've got a lot of developers who have been doing – because it takes 15, 20 years to become a good C++ developer. I mean it's mm. not something you do like that. And But you've got these guys who have been doing it for a long time, and they don't have that security built in. I mean it's it, it's an interesting mm. two completely different print, you know, ideologies and stuff coming together, and it's interesting. Mm. So it's getting better. Really? So you see it you see it getting better in most organizations? What's, what's some of the, the things that they do – uh, that you think helped the most to their SDLC? Um, I would say, you know, the static analysis has become pretty popular using tools like Fortify and FX Copy, even for managed code and stuff, um, doing that during the implementation phase. But also I've seen a lot more shift on the verification and the dynamic analysis and testing. So, you know, if you, especially because a lot of developers coming out are mainly focusing on Java and C Sharp and more higher level languages. I mean, the C C++ stuff seems to be not not a big of a part uh, as a part of in the curriculums anymore. And there's a as a gap. There's a need for those low level programmers. And so, when you when when you're doing turning on tools like G flags with page heap and stuff and stack tracing and doing proper dynamic analysis and on the heap and all the, you, you, these. I'm seeing companies finding a lot more bugs that otherwise would have gone out into production. And, you know, I think it was Forbes and some other NIST and some other places that say, you know, bugs that go into production are going to cost you 20 to 30 times more to fix as if you were to find it early on as opposed to that. Mm -hmm. Do you find that um, the Fortify tool is one of the, one of the leaders in, the, in that market? I mean, I hate to talk specifically about vendor products, but that seems to be the one that comes up quite a bit. It, I would say it's definitely got the biggest share, uh, mm -hmm. biggest stake. Um, people know it. It's it's a good tool. It does generate a lot of false positives, and like any of these tools do, I mean, you, you have to sift through a lot of stuff to get down to the bugs you really care about. So it takes a lot of tuning, but it, it is a powerful tool. Yeah. And you were talking before how you know the best approach, and it's the one that I recommend as well, is to do the static analysis, um, but also do that runtime analysis as well. Yeah, you have to. I mean, I use a bad analogy in class, and <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's it involves puberty. <laughs> it's, saying, it's saying, you know, your code and its source form. I mean, that's your baby. It's 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 static. It only does. It's innocent. And then you compile it. It's like the application going through puberty, and it comes out on the other end, and it's got hormones now. I mean, it, it may do things that you didn't think it was capable of doing, and <laughs> and uh, it had a lot of compiler optimizations and crazy things, and. You've got to test it, and, and anybody who argues that is, is, I think, insane because it's been proven time and time again that through dynamic analysis we find bugs that were missed on the static side. Mm -hmm. and another thing I'll throw out there because you you asked them where I see the most value being had in the SDL is is with um, with proper attack uh, attack surface redu reduction or mitigation and and threat modeling where 
you you take during your requirements what you need to occur, and then you assign things like a security advisor and privacy advisor that's going to track and do the code reviews and stuff. And you you take the attack surface down to the minimum amount that needs to be exposed uh, for that application to work. And then you model the threats. You have to have some expertise there to model the threats that you should be concerned about. So when you're going to do some manual code review and stuff, you know where to focus in on. And by not doing those things and also checking again once you get to the verification phase because things change mm. during that period of development and you've got to look at the attack surface again. I mean, I see a lot of value coming there. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, just in – in our networks, you see the attack surface changing constantly, and software is, is really no different in that respect, that the attack surface is just constantly changing, and keeping up with that can be difficult. Yeah, and watching it for crazy things, too. Like, I downloaded Camtasia software the other day so I could create a video on this AV bypass, and I, I was debugging iTunes, I think it was, and I was like, why the heck are these Camtasia DLLs loaded into iTunes? It was like injecting itself into different places. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you got to watch out for, too, because you never know what's being injected into the, your, your running processes unless you're paying attention. And that's that, you know, that one control or that one module is not participating in the you know, rebasing and things like that, and that breaks everything. Mm. Are, are you specifically uh, a lot of focus on uh, Windows as a platform in your, your classes, Steve, for exploit development? No, we do a lot of Linux, um, look at a lot of Linux stuff as well. I mean, what about OS 10? Do you look at the OS 10 platform too, or not so much? No, we don't do any Mac in the, I mean, the techniques and the principles and everything apply, but no, we don't get into that, mainly because we can't expect everybody to bring a Mac. I mean, I would say it's about one third bring Macs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're doing mostly in virtualization. Uh, are the protections, in your opinion, the same or just different between uh, OS 10, Windows, and Linux? I mean, I'd say Linux w w has always been ahead when you've got people like um, Brad Spangler and stuff with yeah. the uh, PAX and GRSEC and those. I mean, they, those guys have been on top of it. And if you put, if you apply that stuff, it's it hardens it big time. And I would say Linux has always been a little bit ahead. And then closely behind has been Windows. I mean, mm -hmm. Microsoft's done a great job uh, in improving their security. And then Mac, I would say, has always been a little bit behind. It was, wasn't was until like Snow Leopard when ASLR on mm -hmm. Mac was considered enough you know, to be, be a control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, huh. it's interesting. And, and, I, and I love that, you know, that, you know, uh, Linux is, you know, Steve identified Linux as sort of being here maybe a little ahead of the curve for some of the memory protection and all that type of stuff. Yet it takes forever for them to come out with drivers for stuff. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe there's a reason for that. I read all the XKCD cartoons, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Who was that one that said something like, in my, my Linux OS now supports like 10 million CPUs and all this and that. And it's like, yes, but it, does it support um, Flash or that? Or does it support some kind of driver? I can't remember. It's funny. Mm -hmm. Does it support your wireless driver in your laptop? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. No. Uh, does anyone else have questions uh, for Steve? Uh, no. Mike, did you have questions, comments on the, the SDLC kind of stuff? I, I meant to yeah, my, I mean, it, prep it, you on it's, that. It's funny how you, you picked exactly where my brain is turning. I know where um, your brain's going to go now. Where, <laughs> yeah, we yeah, did that's, the mind melt. That's, uh, it means i got to switch it up if I'm getting that predictable. <laughs> no, I, no I, I, I feel like there was a lot of, like, I want to go back and listen to it, unpack it again. But let me ask this question. Who's doing it well? I, you don't have to name names, but, I mean, are you seeing enterprises adopt that? Because, you know, what I heard, and I liked it, I'll tell you a couple of things that I really liked. Assign somebody as an advisor to guide that process, which then suggests to me that they need to have a pretty interesting skill set. It's part project manager, part security person, part development slash coding background with a whole lot of ability to tap dance and, and bring people together. But then we're talking about setting it up at the beginning, working your way through it, testing it at different points, using different types of testing tools, and then making sure at the end that it's both what you wanted and nothing crept into it. That's awesome. Um, I've never seen anybody do that. So have you? I mean, how do we propagate that model forward with some examples? Yeah, I mean, companies like uh, Cisco Systems and Adobe have have um, okay. publicly publicly stated that they do use the SDL, which which is good. I mean, Microsoft, of course, wants anyone using it to, to say that they're using it, especially the medium and larger companies. But 
I mean, in my experience, most organizations are focusing in on key areas of what they think is the most critical to their development life cycle. So if they if they've determined that, hey, we make routers for a living, we make switches for a living and that we would get the most value out of um, uh, attack surface reduction and maybe secure coding and doing the static analysis side. I'm seeing a lot of that happening where they pick and choose where they think the, the most critical areas are. And there's a company like Security Compass. I mean, they focus specifically on as they have some tool called SD Elements, which is real similar to a tool that I deployed at a former employer. Um, where their focus is get in early on because you get more value the earlier in the SDLC that you, you map that. So yes, I do see some companies doing it well, but I think but they're big companies. Yeah. Okay. Bigger companies. And, and I, and I, their I, whole livelihoods are based on their ability to produce code that doesn't get them screwed. And they're also all releasing patches on a pretty consistent basis. Let's go back for a second. Is it a smart idea to, to pick and choose where you place your focus? I mean, are, is is the suggestion that, the SDL is so big that you should pick, or are you kind of suggesting, I see people picking and choosing and gosh, I sure wish they wouldn't. Yeah, no, you're supposed to not skip anything. It's kind of like the whole incident handling process and stuff. Even if it's not going to take you as long to do one of the phases, you should never skip any of the phases. So, I mean, that's one of the things we teach is if you do skip a phase and an attacker can figure out what phase you skipped or kind of didn't uh, do a good job on, there are certain types of vulnerabilities we're going to look for. Right. Yep. So yeah, you're, you're not supposed to skip. All right. One more question then. Um, I am myself from an economics perspective bought in on incorporated earlier and you have less problems later, which typically makes it cheaper in the short run. When you start to implement something like this, let's set aside the growing pains. Do we need to, does it extend any timelines? Let's say in the first couple of weeks to couple months, once it's implemented, I mean, is there an upfront cost that we pay to get back-end savings? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's your return on security investment, right? <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm just trying to understand, too, like, you know, yeah. I'd have to calibrate this to say to somebody, look, yeah, it's going to add two weeks at the beginning, but we'll go faster here, we'll hit the same release date, we'll have less problems, it's less money, better, whatever. I'm just trying to think through how, how to make that case. Yeah, um, I mean, yes, there is an overhead, of course, and your developers more than likely are going to be quite resistant to it because, one, it might take away and, and inhibit their creativity, which is never good. That's why developers leave. And um, it's also more work for them. So the more you can automate, and this is where you bring in a security advisor, like I was saying, where, and the more you can automate this and make it easier for them to adopt it, the, the more successful it's going to be. I mean, but I've seen so, in some organizations it really has to be a mandate coming from senior level management yeah, because people yeah. were resistant. Well, I mean, so the, the funny thing is uh, when we look at constraints, the, the way to unleash constraints is creativity. The simplest way to explain it, there are three primary colors. And, and uh, th there are, what, 65 million, 70 million, 80 million colors that come from those three primary colors. So, the, I, so I always like to point out the, the, the upside of, of constraints for creativity. But that's a really interesting point that I hadn't considered. The flip side is um, I, I think that your statement is universal. The easier we make security for other people to do while doing their jobs, the more likely they'll do it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a, it's, it's great guidance for anybody to live by. This is awesome. Yeah. I have a lot great. to learn. Thanks, man. Thanks. Steve, when are you teaching next? Uh, Sandsfire in Baltimore. We've got we're running 760 and 660, but I'm doing 760, and we've got 20 people, which is the most I've ever had in that class because it's pretty niche. Right. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Who are you asking? Uh, <laughs> that, that, yeah. that was, in fact, directed at you, Steve. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Three words to describe yourself. <laughs> Um, ambitious, stubborn, and curious. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? I don't know. I think maybe something weird like a, a comma, you know, like the sickle thing. With the yeah, yeah, those are cool. I like it. No. <laughs> if you if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Affliction. 
<laughs> in, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I don't know this game. It's popular in Europe. He's been to Europe a lot. So You've I'm been surprised. to Europe a lot, so yeah, maybe you. I, I probably want to go first because I either want to go first because it'll be a good thing, or I want to get it over with. <laughs> That's choose, good. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Jude Law, so I want to get his looks, and He's Shirley right. Manson, nice from Garbage. Awesome. Steve, wow. thanks so much for coming back on Security Weekly. It was a pleasure having you. You can check out Steve's class uh, in Baltimore at Sands Fire. Two really, really super technical, super awesome classes uh, offered from Sands by, uh, by Steve. So thanks for coming on the show, Steve. Thanks for having me. It's a great time. And with that, we are going to take a short break, come back, and talk about our stories of the week. So stay tuned. Don't Ooh. go anywhere. <laughs> 